Well, hello, Woodman. We are so glad that you are with us for this time of worship and the word. And uh, we're gonna do something a little differently today as we continue studying what it means to be the church. We thought we'd invite some of our, our Woodman community musicians, singers to get involved. And so you're gonna see them coming up on the screens with us, singing along, playing along. And, and I actually <laughs> discovered something pretty amazing that some of you at home are singing, like not just singing with the worship, uh, but actually getting your instruments out and playing along with us as we worship. And so I wanna encourage you to continue to do that until we can be face to face in the room together. So let's sing this song proclaiming uh, the great work of Jesus Christ. Why search the world But it couldn't fail me Praise and treasures that fail are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied.
now I'm not Oh, with your blood you, you bought my freedom Hallelujah for the cross And so, Father in heaven, we come before you in response to what your, your son has done for us, we have nothing else to say but hallelujah, God. God, I pray in this service that you would fill us with hope, Lord, knowing that the God who conquered sin and death is the same God who, who parted that Red Sea for Israel, who brings dry bones to life, God. There is nothing that you cannot do, Lord. So may we take heart in this season, God. May we find our courage, our strength, in you, knowing that what you have done in the past, you will do again, and that you are faithful to your people. Yes, this in all, in the name of Jesus. We are so glad that you are here with us. Thank you for joining us as we lift up God's name in praise and as we prepare our hearts to learn from his word. We have been so encouraged by you. The stories that we have been hearing, how you have been faithfully gathering in your summer huddles and how you have been praying and coming alongside people in your community, whether that's people in your huddle your neighbors, meeting real practical needs in our city. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, and thank you for your continued generosity to give to the work of ministry through your tithes and offerings here at Woodman. Um, we have been seeing God move in powerful and profound ways, in part to the ways that you are faithfully giving and serving. I wanna highlight one resource that may be um, a benefit for, for many of you. I know it has been a benefit for my family personally. Our kids ministry team has been working very hard week in and week out to provide resources to equip moms and dads to raise spiritual healthy families. That's one of our core values of our kids ministry team. So on our website, under the Family Resources page. Every week, you'll see a brand new kid-friendly teaching video that your kids can watch. There's activities, there's upbeat songs. I know we have personally benefited from that, um, those resources, and I would encourage you to check those out if you haven't already. Well, up next in our service, Pastor Kurt is going to continue in our Essentials series as we look at traits of the early church. So if you don't have your Bibles, go ahead, grab your Bibles, and let's prepare our hearts to learn what God has for us today. Hello, Woodman Valley Chapel. I'm Pastor Kurt, one of the pastors here at Woodman, and, and my great honor to be able to open God's Word with you guys today. As you know, we're continuing in our series called Essential, and Essential is all about looking back at the early church to see what we can learn from how they were doing ministry. And today we've got kind of an exciting one about powerful ministry. Now, it's also a really important day for another reason. We've spent the last four weeks in just one verse, Acts 2.42, and today, we get to move into Acts 2.43. So let me pray, and then we are going to jump right in. Father God, we are um, so grateful that you, the Lord of the universe, Lord, you care about us. You seek to have relationship with us. And Lord, we are in awe that you actually call us to be a part of your ministry. Father, the work that you're doing to redeem this world, and, and we are a part of it. Father, we thank you for that privilege. Lord, as we open your word today, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be active in us, would be working in us, and those messages that you have just for us, Father, that we would be attuned to those. So please bless this time, bless my words, as we are about to open your word. It's in the name of your Son that we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to be in Acts 2.43, but I do want to go back and read Acts 2.42 to set the stage, and we should be really familiar with this. Again, we've been in this uh, verse for the last couple of weeks. 
Acts 2, 43, or 42 and 43. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So we see here in Acts 43 that every soul, the Holy Spirit was working so strongly in the early church that everyone was in awe at what was happening. And it says here that what was in awe about were these signs and wonders. So wonders were these miracles that were created to, um, to have excitement and amazement in people's minds. Signs were very similar. That was a miracle that conveyed some instruction and pointed directly to God. So these signs and wonders were captivating the early church and they were galvanizing the ministry of the early church. So much so that it was establishing the credibility of the apostles and the church. And so even the communities around this church were amazed about what was happening in that early church. And I think that's what we want for ourselves, right? It's what we want for the ministry of Woodman Valley and even our own personal ministry, that it would be powerful ministry. And so when I say ministry, I'm not just talking about what we do here at Woodman, but what you do in your own homes, with your families, with friends, with relatives, what we do, how we individually try to live out God's call in our lives. You know, there's one word that connects verse 42 and verse 43. Small word, it's the word and. But when we see and, we always want to look back and say what caused it. So what, what helped to cause this powerful ministry that the early church was understanding or was seeing? So there's really four things. And it's the four things that we've been looking at for the last four weeks. So let me go over them one more time in a little different order and maybe a slightly different perspective. The first thing that the early church was known for was the practice of the Lord's Supper, which is a reminder of our identity in Christ, that Christ loved us so much that he died for us, that he removed all of our sins, and that we have a right standing with Jesus. And so it's so important that this early church had a, an identity centered in Christ. Now, you might be struggling with your identity. You might be wondering, does Jesus really love me? Could he possibly love me? Maybe he doesn't know the things that I've done in my past. Well, I want to just read three verses over you, and there's many more. If you're struggling with your identity in Christ, I would encourage you to search into God's word to find out what he says about you, what the creator of the universe says about your identity. First of all, we're seen as righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are righteous and we're also seen as God's children. Romans 8.15 The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. We are righteous, we are his children, and Romans 8.37 reminds us that we are loved. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see, guys, our identity in Christ is that we are righteous, we are his children, and that we are deeply loved. And communion helps to remind us of that identity that we have in Christ. We're also to be engaged in prayer. And as we talked about last week, prayer is the opportunity for us to have community and conversation with the God of the universe, to understand his will and to seek out what our role might be in it. And not only do we commit ourselves to our identity and to prayer, but also to God's word. We search in God's word for truth, right? We understand that it is useful. It's useful as we saw for teaching, training, correcting, and training in righteousness and reproof. So we not only know our identity in Christ. We not only spend time in prayer and in God's word, but we're also called to spend time in community. And I think for a lot of us, this season has been so difficult because that community has taken different shapes and in some cases has been cut off altogether. But we are called to be in community. We are called to be in relationship with one another. That relationship oftentimes leads to accountability where our brothers and sisters can point out things in our life that maybe we don't see. It also can offer great encouragement for those times when we are in need or in help that we've got other people in that journey with us that can encourage us along the way. Now, I know some of you might be saying, you know, actually, I'm getting all of my Bible teaching from podcasts or online sermons like this one. Uh, I'm doing my praying at home, so I really, I'm not sure I need community. And even when I go to huddles or when I go to small groups, I don't get much out of them. Well, I just would want to say to you that 
You may feel like you don't get much out of them, but, but scripture is pretty clear that we're not called to be Lone Ranger Christians. We're called to be in community. And I would say, even if you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it, maybe you're going to those huddles or the small groups because those people need to hear from you. Maybe it's not about what we receive, but what we're able to give through some of those groups. Those areas make up what I'll call complementary ministry that we need to pursue all four of those in order to have powerful ministry. Now, I gotta tell you a little something about myself before I go into this little story because it's important that you know that I am a big Denver Broncos fan. I have lived in Colorado most all of my life and I've been an ardent fan for years, but the story I'm gonna tell is, is not one of the great memories in Denver Bronco history. It's Super Bowl 48. In Super Bowl 48, the Broncos got crushed by the Seattle Seahawks 43 to eight. It was one of the worst blowouts in Super Bowl history. The interesting thing about it was Denver came into that game with the highest scoring offense in the history of the NFL. In fact, they set passing records. Peyton Manning had the most touchdowns and the most yards ever by a quarterback in the NFL. Denver had this great passing attack and so they were rolling into the Super Bowl and I, among others, was feeling pretty confident. But in the end, the statistics were pretty amazing. The Seattle Seahawks defense scored more than this all-time great offense. Their special teams scored more than the Denver offense. And of course, the Seattle offense itself outscored the Denver offense. This was a complete drubbing, and it was that way because Seattle played complementary football. Their offense supported their defense. Their special teams supported both. And my point here is that when we are thinking about having powerful ministry, we need to have complementary ministry. It's not enough to say, well, I study God's word, but I do it alone and not with others. It's not enough to say I've got a great prayer life, but you know what, my identity in Christ isn't very clear. You see, these four areas, we need to be pursuing all of them. We need to believe our identity in the Lord. We need to spend time in prayer with him and discerning his will for our lives. We need to go into scripture to confirm that will and understand what God is calling us to do. And lastly, we've got to be in community. So we see that the ministry of the early church was powerful. And now we're going to look at the source of that power. So turn, if you will, to John 15. And we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at that passage. Now, while you're looking for it, let me give you a little background about this period. So John 15, and the, and the verses we're going to look at, is after the Lord's Supper. So Jesus has had the Last Supper with his disciples. He's given them the Lord's Supper. And it's before the Garden of Gethsemane when he is arrested. So in between that time, it seems like they're taking a walk from wherever they were for the supper, this upper room, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is instructing his disciples. And it's pretty clear he's instructing them because his earthly ministry is coming to an end. And Jesus is about to hand over the reins to his disciples to spread the gospel to all of the world, and so he shares with them this powerful allegory that we see in John 15. I'm going to read the whole passage to you, and then we'll go back and break it down a little bit. In John 15, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So we see, first of all, in this allegory that Jesus is calling himself the true vine. Now, for his disciples, who are of Jewish descent, they would have recognized that Israel in the Old Testament was called the vine. But Israel was an imperfect vine. It was unfruitful and unfaithful. And so Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. I am the fulfillment of the vine. And through me, my fruit will be given to all nations. If Jesus is the vine, then in this allegory, we are the branches, right? And, and there's a word that you might have recognized it occurs 11 times in John 15. It's the word abide, not a word that we use probably very often these days, but it, it means to remain or to stay in me. And so Jesus is saying over and over again that we are to remain in him. He is the source of our power. In fact, he says we can do nothing without him. 
And the word nothing there, if you look it up, it actually means, um, well, it means nothing. There's nothing we can't do or we can do if we're not in the power of Jesus Christ. We draw life from the vine. I wonder how many of us, though, are trying to go out on our own, trying to do things in our own strength for our own purposes. It can be a futile attempt when we're not connected to the Lord's power. So how do we stay connected to Jesus? Well, it's back to what we have just talked about, studying God's word, praying, having a clear identity in who we are, and being fellowship with other believers. As the branches, our only purpose, our main purpose here is to produce and to bear fruit. Now, fruit does really two things. Number one, fruit has seeds in it, right? So when the seeds fall to the ground, they replenish and they grow again. And so we are to be a reproducing fruit. When we're doing great ministry, we should see others coming to the Lord and then doing the same. The other interesting thing about fruit is it actually takes an awful lot of work for the plant to grow the fruit. It takes a lot of energy, but it's not for the benefit of the plant. That fruit is to be given away. That fruit is eaten and consumed by others. So when we think about having a fruitful ministry, it's, it's not that we become more prosperous or we obtain fame or anything for our own benefit, but it's that our fruit that we, that we bear is to serve others and to go out in the world. Now we also hear a little bit here about pruning. And we understand that God as the vine dresser does prune from time to time. In fact, it's kind of neat how this verse is laid out. It talks about bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, and then bearing much fruit. You see, even when we're fruitful, God is always working and pruning and sometimes using hard circumstances so that our ministry can be even more powerful going forward. And then we have the warnings in here about the branches that are disconnected from Jesus, the fact that they wither and die. Now, some people have looked at this story and, and they think that maybe that's talking about Christians who have lost their salvation and, and are then thrown into a fire or into eternal punishment. We always want to be careful when we're looking at allegories that we don't try to stretch it too far. Usually allegories or Jesus parables have really just one purpose. And so we, we want to be careful of taking the secondary pieces of those allegories or those stories and trying to build theology on them. So most commentators would agree that what this is talking about is if we're not plugged into the power of Jesus, that our ministry is just going to be withered and ineffective until we can get back into that right relationship with Jesus. It's not that he moves away from us or that he changes, but it's that sometimes we separate ourselves from his power. You see, there's great purpose in powerful ministry when we are connected to Jesus. Verse 7 has one of those promises that sometimes can be a stumbling block for us, right? It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Isn't that interesting that whatever we wish, God will do, and sometimes we only focus on that part of the verse, that whatever I ask, God will do. Well, we talked last week a lot about prayer, and, and let me just make it clear again that there are conditions here. That number one, we need to be abiding in Jesus. We need to be close to Jesus. We need to discern his will, understand what his call is for us. And when we ask for those things that will glorify God that are part of his will, then he will answer them, and fruitful ministry follows. You know, about a month into our um, stay-at-home orders or when it changed from stay-at-home to safe-at-home and we were able to go out a little bit, my youngest son, Cooper, decided to take a bike ride. He had been so tired of being locked up and not being able to leave home. And so he just asked, Dad, can I just grab a bike and go ride around for a while? I said, sure. So we got the bike pumped up and he took it out. I get this call about 40 minutes later. He sounds terrible. He says, Dad, I'm about to faint. I don't know where I am. Can you come get me? Now the good news is we've got this cool app, Life360, so we can see where all of our kids are. So I saw where he was, I hopped in my truck and I drove out and found him. And I saw him sitting off the side of the road. His bike was half in this dirt road and half up on somebody else's lawn and he had his hands in his knees and I wasn't even sure if he was awake then and I kind of shook him, grabbed the bike, threw it in the back of the truck and drove him home. When we got home, we found out that he wasn't sure if he had dinner the night before. He slept through breakfast he didn't have lunch. He just hopped on his bike in the midday and went for this long bike ride. And his body was just breaking down because there was nothing inside of him, no energy, no food, nothing to sustain him. I wonder sometimes if our own little personal ministries aren't a little bit like that. We desire, we want to have fruitful ministry. We want to have purpose and meaning in our life. We want to do great things for God and yet we never quite get there. Or we look around and we see other people that have fruitful ministries and we wonder, what, what's wrong with me? Why isn't God using me? And I think, it, again, it's because we're not connected to the power source. We're not connected with Jesus. And if we're not connected with him, 
then what are we connected to? What are those things that are filling you up if it's not the Holy Spirit, if it's not the work of Jesus? There's an awful lot of things in the world that are trying to take our attention and keep us busy and tell us we'll find purpose and meaning in it, but they all end up leading us in the wrong direction. We need to be connected to the power source, and that power source is Jesus. So we've seen that there was powerful ministry. We've seen that the power source is Jesus, and, and now we see that inside of this power is, is just one word, and it's love. Look at John 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. For you are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Well, we've seen that the word abide happens 11 times in John 15, and now the word love happens nine times. I think these are two concepts that we're absolutely supposed to follow. And it's interesting to see that this love comes from God the Father to Jesus. Jesus pours it out on his disciples and then asks his disciples to pour it out on everyone else. You see, we are to live and to understand the great love that comes from Jesus, that, that God rains down on us, but we aren't to hold on to it. We are to pass that through to other people. Jesus' disciples are marked by three things in this verse. First, in verses 9 and 10, we're to be marked by our obedience. Jesus was obedient to, the, obedient to the commandments of God, and we are called to do likewise. Jesus was our perfect example in this. Because we love Jesus, we follow his commandments. It would be awfully hard to stand up here and say that we love Jesus, but actually we don't follow anything that he, that he teaches. We follow what Jesus teaches, even some of the difficult things. Now, it's interesting that Jesus' love never wavers, but it is possible for us to get disconnected from it, to move away. I don't know if you've ever had a, a day where maybe you lost your temper. Maybe, honestly, you were involved in some kind of sinful behavior. Those moments are awfully tough to enter into prayer and have great times with your father, aren't they? Kind of like Adam in the garden when he knew about his sin and he tried to hide from God. Sometimes when we're feeling the weight of our bad choices, we tend to separate ourselves from God. Well, we're called to confess those, and he welcomes us back into his presence. But we must be obedient to God's will, and we must follow Jesus. It's what gives us our power. Not only are his disciples known for their obedience, but they're known for his, their joy. We see that in verse 11. And joy here is not a superficial joy. It's not that everything in life is fun and easy and there's nothing to worry about. Jesus is saying he has great joy, and yet we know that he was a man of many sorrows who suffered greatly in his life and his death. So joy for us is not a result of obedience, but it's being aligned with God's will. If we are aligned with God's will, then we will be obedient and we will experience joy. Disciples were known for their obedience, they were known for their joy, and they were recognized by their self-sacrifice. If you ever wonder how Jesus feels about you, just remember, he says there is, is no greater love than a man would lay down a life, his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. And we are called to do likewise. It's a great blessing to know that God thinks so much of us that Jesus would give his life for us. The hard thing is we're actually called to do the same for those around us. We are to love fully, unconditionally, and sacrificially. In verse 12, Jesus starts to talk about servants and friends, and he says, you're no longer servants, you're now friends. And, and one of the commentators that I looked at had a great analogy that this is almost like a king gathering all their servants together, servants who are used to just taking orders without questioning, and the king is gathering them together in his court, in his inner, inner circle, and he says, here's my plans, here's my strategy for reaching the world, and I want you to be a part of it. I'm going to share it with you. There's nothing hidden. There's no hidden agendas. And I want you to be the ones to take this out into the world. This is a pretty amazing thing that the God of the universe would call you and I into the work of ministry. And our work is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. 
to let people know that the God of the universe is real and that he desires a relationship with us. To remind them that we are separated from this just and good and holy God because of sin and sin mars our life and we can't be in the presence of God while our sin exists. So God sent Jesus and Jesus paid a price that you and I could not and we are now seen as righteous so we can have a relationship with the God of the universe. And we remind them that we are people of love and people of service because God first loved us and so that's what we do to a hurting world. This passage ends with verse 17 where we are told to love one another. And it's interesting that right after this passage, right after this verse, Jesus starts to talk about uh, the world around the disciples. And he warns them that the world hates him. The world hates Jesus and it will hate his followers. It will hate his disciples. This is gonna be a hard road to be a Jesus follower in the world. He protects hatred, opposition, oppression to all those who follow him. And I think, again, we don't have to look too far to see that in our world today. Because he knows that there is so much opposition outside, he implores them to love one another. That these disciples, don't let factions divide you. Don't be disunified. Don't, don't fight over minor things. You guys have to love each other well. You have to be unified. You have to abide in me. You are the inner circle, and you are the church that's going forward. You know, here at Woodman Valley Chapel, we, we say often our vision is to love well and change lives through Christ. Love well comes from this very verse, John 15, 17. You and I are called to love well, not just because Woodman says it, but the scripture says it. Now, here's some great news. We've been trying to share with you some of the, the cool things that have happened through Woodman, through all of you, through all of our ministry. Well, let me, let me go through a couple more with you. Let's talk about the powerful work, the fruit that is coming out of Woodman Valley Chapel. We have filled nearly 50 trailers full of food since the COVID pandemic. We've served over 10,000 people. We have nearly 1,000 hours of volunteer time. We've served 130 schools. And we say when, when we say serve schools, that means we've given somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 350 snacks and meals to those schools, and we've done that 130 times. We've served 3,000 healthcare workers and first responders with food and encouragement. We continue to support international ministries and missionaries, and we have some 300 lay leaders who right now are leading huddle groups in their homes and on our campuses. You know, the kind of interesting thing, and I think the cool thing, is that this is not new to Woodman. We didn't drum up all of these ministries and all these new ways to do ministry just when COVID-19 hit. We actually have been doing this stuff for years. You guys have been so faithful. We've all been working together as the body of Woodman Valley to serve our community, to serve the people around us, and to love well those in our midst. And I want to tell you, I think you're doing a fantastic job. So loving well. Man, how's that for a theme for a church? We've got printed on t-shirts. We've got it on the walls of our buildings. And it's to remind us that our world is hurting and fractured it's confused, it's angry, and, and we, the church, have the ability to love well and to bring hope into this hurting world. Why don't you think that's a message that needs to be told? We are so busy fighting and talking about what we agree with and disagree with and how different we are and just pulling ourselves apart, and I think this message of loving well is so key for the church to stand up and to take that ground and to love our communities well. So I wonder for you, what might that look like? It may be that you continue serving in some of the ways that you are. You might be thinking, well, I'd love to serve, but it, it's hard to go find an event or an activity or a homeless shelter or whatever to serve in, in in this age because we all have to wear masks and social distance and maybe there just aren't some of the opportunities there have been before. But I encourage you to get creative. What might loving well look like for you? Is it time to start writing letters again? sending texts, picking up a phone, and just talking to people that you haven't been in contact with in a while and let them know that you care for them, you've been thinking about them, you've been praying for them, and is there anything you can do for them? Let's continue to be a church that loves well. Jesus commands us to love well, and I think it's a beautiful command for us to follow. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you for the powerful ministry that's coming out of Woodman and other churches, Father, that when your people are aligned with you, Father, when we recognize that our power comes through you, that we can do great things, we can produce great fruit. Father, for those brothers and sisters who are feeling like, I'm not sure if I'm producing fruit, I'm not sure if I have great ministry, Father, would you encourage us, maybe show us those areas of our spiritual life that we can focus on to get back and connected with you. 
Father, we thank you that by staying close to Jesus, we can provide good fruit, that we can love well. And I would just pray, Father, that you would do what you need to do so that we go from producing good fruit to producing great fruit. We ask all of this, Father, in the name of your Son. Amen.
Well, Woodman Valley, Pastor Josh is going to be back with us next week and continue this series. Uh, but for now, why don't you receive the benediction as you go out and hopefully to do great, powerful, and fruitful ministry. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen.